All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what I want to uh, present today is a new neural network architecture, and this architecture performs a segmentation in the subset of the input dimensions. So I, I depicted here N to M dimensions. Uh, but more specifically, I will focus on the case where we go from two-dimensional input uh, and produce uh, one-dimensional output. And uh, I think it may so sound a bit uncommon at first, but I think uh, in uh, retinal imaging, especially in optical coherence tomography or OCT, uh, there are some interesting applications. Um, and two of them I would like to highlight today are the segmentation of retinal layers and uh, segmentation of geographic atrophy. So for all of you who attended uh, this morning's keynote lecture, this should not be very new anymore. So the retina is the back of our eye. Uh, and provides us vision. Um, and because uh, through the pupil, we can uh, easily acquire medical images uh, non-invasively. Um, and this is basically what you would see on the left, a normal uh, color image of the retina. And on the right, this image is uh, acquired with uh, optical coherence tomography, OCT. And it provides a cross-sectional view of the retina. Um, and such a cross-sectional image, this 2D image, we call it a B-scan. Um, and you can already see here that this two-dimensional image uh, actually represents information on the retina on a uh, one-dimensional line on the retinal surface. And if we acquire multiple of these B-scans, then you can actually reconstruct uh, a full volume of the, of the retina. Um, so the first application that we're, uh, we're targeting is the segmentation of retinal layers. Um, there are many retinal layers, but there are three important ones that we focus on which is at the top of the retina, the, uh, the ILM. Uh, that's where the light enters. Then near the bottom of the retina, there's uh, the retinal pigment, the RPE, the fuzzy layer here in orange. And at the bottom, uh, Bruch's membrane, here depicted in, in green, which is actually the top of the choroid, uh, the vascular layer below the retina. And the way we represent these layers in our uh, application is that uh, we give a label for every layer, for every column in the image, and then a value of zero would represent that this layer is completely at the top of the image, and a value of one would indicate that it's completely at the bottom of the image. So if we would model a, a CNN architecture as a regression model, then we can actually train it uh, using, for example, a mean squared error as an output, and then in this way uh, uh, make a regression prediction of where these layers occur. Uh, the data set we use for this uh, comes from a publicly available data set where we have 384 uh, OCT volumes and we split it in a training validation and test set. Uh, some of them are affected by AMD, the most common cause of blindness in the Western world, and others from uh, normal patients. And each of these uh, volumes consists of 100 B scans, uh, 100 of these two-dimensional images, and each of them are 512 by 1,000 pixels wide. Um, and we pet them for convenience to 512 to 1024. And later, uh, if I introduce the network architecture, you will see why. So the second application is the segmentation of geographic atrophy. Uh, so this also occurs in uh, patients affected with age-related macular degeneration in the advanced stage. Uh, it's atrophy of the retinal pigment and the photoreceptors and choriocapillaris. And uh, you can already see the lesion probably on the 2D and FOS images uh, here. Uh, this white line represents the location of the cross-sectional image, the OCT B scan. And there is some additional evidence for, uh, RP, uh, for um, uh, geographic atrophy. Um, so they prov uh, provide kind of a complementary information to the disease status. Um, so for example, the hypertransmission below the retina you can see here. Uh, is another indication that, there, that there's atrophy of the uh, retinal pigment here. Um, so what we did, we uh, delineated on the unfast images the uh, atrophy lesion, and then if we project that onto the OCT image, we actually get a label for every column in this image. So again, a uh, two-dimensional input image, and there's a one-dimensional output uh, representing uh, the presence or absence of GA for every column here. So we might be, uh, we may train a neural network to uh, predict where this atrophy occurs, and then use, for example, the binary cross-entropy as a loss function there. Uh, so the input to the network is only this, uh, this two-dimensional OCT image where we have a label for every column. Uh, data for this uh, application comes from the Rotterdam study where we have 55 top one OCT volumes. They are slightly different in terms of resolution, so there is 128 B-scans now per volume. Uh, and they're much higher uh, and uh, not as wide as the uh, other applications, so 512 pixels wide uh, and a bit higher, but most of it is actually noise, so we crop them to uh, uh, around the interesting region of 512 by 512. 
so to summarize the two applications, what we're looking for is a network architecture that's able to transform a 512, 5024 input to a 1 by 1024 output. Um, and then the three different layers are represented in the feature dimension of this network architecture. So with one model that predicts uh, the locations of all of the three layers. And for the GA segmentation application, we're looking for a network that transforms 512 by 512 input to uh, 1 by 512 output and then uh, one binary label for every column in this image. And the network architecture that we propose in this work is compared against two baseline methods. And um, I will start with introducing those, uh, those methods first and then we'll see how they extend or combine into the, uh, the actual model. Um, so this is base approach one. Um, I'll try to explain a little bit how we try to depict everything here. So this, um, White rectangles that you see, uh, they represent the size, or the size of the rectangle uh, represent the size of the feature maps in the image uh, on a logarithmic scale. And what we do to obtain our uh, goal here is to, um, to do the downsampling uh, only in the vertical dimension. So every uh, blue arrow here represents a downsampling operation that only um, divides the height every time. So in nine steps, we go from 512 pixels height to one pixel height. Um, so a 512 by 512 input is con converted uh, to 1 by 512 and uh, similarly if we take a wider image then we get 1024 pixels as output also. Uh, and within every uh, resolution level we apply a residual block uh, to actually do the, the convolutions and the non-linearities. Um, so one problem with this approach is that uh, we do aggregate all the vertical context now, but uh, horizontally the, uh, there's not much information captured in this network architecture. So there's very, very limited horizontal context that uh, we uh, aggregate with this network. And a common solution for that problem is to uh, go to uh, encode a decoder structure, for example, in, uh, in UNET. Um, and that's what we do uh, mainly in 2D uh, image segmentation. So this encoder allows to aggregate uh, the large context and all input dimensions, and then the decoder uh, will upsample again to the desired resolution. Uh, and we can adapt it to our problem also to do the, uh, the doubt sampling uh, like we would normally do in UNES. So this time there are the green arrows represent two by two normal down sampling operations. And if we upsample only in the uh, horizontal dimension, we also achieve our goal of going from 512 by 512 to 512 by one. And um, one thing, so, that, so that's this. And, and similarly, if we have 1,024 pixels in uh, width, then we can also apply this network architecture. It will still work. Um, but one thing that uh, is lacking uh, compared to the origin, original unit are the shortcut connections. And they were actually introduced in, in UNET, uh, well, for multiple reasons. But one reason is uh, especially that it's quite hard to go from a one by one feature map and to upsample back to your original resolution uh, and then exactly reconstruct the, the precise location of your, uh, your, the segmentation task you're interested in. So this, this uh, spatial res resolution at the bottom of the network is completely lost and it can be quite hard to re reconstruct it uh, in an efficient manner. Um, so that's what we think is lacking with this network architecture. Um, because we, uh, we, we, there's no natural way to, uh, to put these shortcut connections as in the regular UNET. And uh, the reason is, is that there is a mismatch in the dimension of the feature maps between the encoder and the decoder. So a direct uh, concatenation wouldn't work. Um, so what we propose in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, to do to solve this problem and basically to merge the two baseline approaches is to replace these shortcut connections with uh, shortcut subnetworks where at every layer of resolution we apply uh, a similar network architecture to the base one approach, which does the downsampling only in the vertical dimension. Uh, and if you apply this at every layer, then you do actually obtain a feature map with which you can concatenate. Um, so hopefully this will allow us to also include the context in the horizontal dimension. So to summarize, uh, what we uh, hypothesize is that we, uh, we have three network architectures now. The base one, which is lacking probably the horizontal context. Base two might have problems in accurate localization. And the proposed network architecture merges the two. And we think that it is an efficient way to solve the, the task of going from 2D to 1D. Um, and uh, actually, our results also confirm this hypothesis. And I want to highlight a few of them. So these are the results on the layer segmentation for the proposed architecture. Um, 
So in the top image you see the reference uh, annotation and in the bottom you see our, uh, our results um, and the graph on the right depicts the difference with the reference. So it's not 100% accurate but you have to realize that it's uh, maybe also slightly subjective in some locations, especially where this bump in the RP or in the orange layer uh, occurs. Uh, but in general, I think it's a, it's a good approximation to what we're interested in. And if we compare it to the, for example, the base one approach, um, one very obvious uh, difference uh, occurs in the green uh, layer, the, the Brooks membrane layer uh, at the bottom of the retina. And this is the network architecture that lacks the uh, horizontal context. And uh, because Brooks membrane is a very thin layer, it's not always very clearly visible. Uh, it might be hard if you don't have the full horizontal context to, uh, to accurately predict it. Um, and that's what we see what's failing here. Uh, but, but usually you can derive from the larger context where it is because this is a very firm layer that never really deforms a lot. So this uh, prediction doesn't make sense if you have the larger context. And if we compare it to the other uh, approach, the base two, we do have the large horizontal context. Um, and you can see that the Brooks membrane is now also a smooth line again. Uh, but what uh, this network architecture fails to reproduce is the, uh, is the small details and the uh, irregularities, for example, in the, in the RPE and the, in the orange line. So it is able to capture globally the, the shape of the retina and the, and the structure, but to find details, uh, it has some problems of, uh, of reconstructing them. So this, uh, this also supports the hypothesis of uh, the, the problems with the two base architectures. Numerically, we can find the same thing. So the proposed architecture performs better than the two baseline methods. Uh, these are the numbers representing the distance to the reference in pixels. Um, but more interestingly, if we look to, if we compare the two base me methods, then we can see that uh, base one is a bit uh, better because it does have this uh, uh, horizontal context, which is important. Um, but for the Brooks membrane, um, uh, sorry, the base one uh, does have the, uh, the accurate localization, which is important, but for a Brooks membrane, for which you have to need a large context, then actually the base two is the better of the two options. So I think also numerically we can support that, uh, that these are indeed the things that, uh, that characterize the different networks. If we go to the results for the GA segmentation, we, uh, I depict here in uh, gray the reference area, the annotation that was uh, annotated by uh, our observers. Uh, and um, the different colors represents the outputs of the different models. So for every column, we get a probability that we need to threshold to also do a segmentation here. Um, so the proposed method is quite accurate and is able to, to find these uh, areas of atrophy. Uh, if we compare that to the red line for uh, base one, we can see in the left image that it's also able to uh, recognize the atrophy. But there, is also, there are also two responses at locations where if you look at a larger context, you would see that it's not actually atrophy. Uh, but this network architecture is unable to incorporate that. And similarly, on the right image, if we look at this right line, then it, it does find the atrophy. But the, the part in the middle where there, are, there is a bit of less hypertransmission, there it fails to recognize that this is actually part of the lesion. And uh, again, if we look at the base two, it also is able to uh, find the atrophy, especially in the left image. Uh, but it doesn't really, uh, uh, it's not able to find the exact border of the atrophy area. So the, the likelihood of the, uh, of the model, the probability you see here is, uh, is smoothed out over the entire image. And in this case, in the right image, it didn't actually uh, find the atrophy at all. If we combine uh, multiple B scans and uh, look at the projection in an AFAS uh, view uh, and compare the, uh, the results of the different methods, this is what we get. Uh, so we can cal calculate the dice coefficients uh, to compare the reference annotation with the uh, segmentations of the different methods. Uh, they're not super high. Uh, there are different reasons for that. One of them is probably uh, that uh, registrations might be off and sometimes because the graders actually had uh, uh, used also the invas uh, modality. So um, we're not really sure what's the upper limit of what's possible. Um, and the difference between the, the proposed and the base one doesn't seem very large, uh, but if we compare them on a pairwise base, we actually do see that this proposed method is, uh, is better than the two uh, baseline methods, also uh, statistically. So some, uh, some limitations of this uh, work is that uh, we compared our proposed method to two baseline methods, but actually the two baseline methods uh, 
uh, have much less parameters that they use to make the predictions. So uh, uh, 35 million for the proposed method compared to eight or 10 million for the other two uh, methods. Uh, but I would like to say like there's not a clear natural way to compensate for this. You would have to make some arbitrary choices. Um, and I do think that it's really the difference in architecture which allows for integrating the context and, uh, and the localization. That's the main difference between the, the methods. So we want to extend this method also to be applied for, uh, for 3D to 2D. Uh, we didn't do that yet, especially also because the OCT volumes are quite anisotropic. So the resolution between B scans is much, uh, the, the distance between them is much larger than uh, within one B scan. So you have to make some, some adaptations to get this to work. It's also more memory intensive. So I'm not sure if this is uh, possible uh, uh, immediately to apply to a full volume. Um, the next step that we're working on currently is um, if you look at this application for a GA segmentation, uh, we actually have high resolution two dimensional uh, data across this line where the, the, the two modalities meet uh, in two orthogonal dimensions. And I think with an extension to this network architecture, we can actually merge them into one view. So to get uh, accurate inputs from multiple modalities um, using uh, an extension to this network architecture. So to conclude, uh, we introduce a new neural network architecture uh, that uh, allows for mapping N input dimensions to M output dimensions. So do segmentation in a subset of your input dimension. Um, and um, we compared it to two baseline methods and uh, we, sh we show that the uh, ability of this network architecture to integrate the context in all input dimensions combined with the uh, ability to do accurate localization uh, actually provides uh, beneficial uh, uh, results to this method compared to the two baselines. And we see that there are useful applications in retinal OCT, but I'm uh, sure that there are also other fields in medical imaging that, uh, where it might be apl applicable. So if you have any ideas there, uh, I'd be happy to know about it, and you can contact me if you want uh, details on the implementation of this uh, network architecture. So thank you for your attention. This work is open for discussion. Thanks for the uh, nice presentation. Um, have you considered an even simpler baseline where you would use a vanilla 2D unit and just put the um, pooling layer at the end where you have the high resolution 2D? Uh, yes, I have considered that. Um, even tried some preliminary uh, implementation, but I'm not sure why actually, well in the end I came up with this uh, method and it seems a more uh, natural way to solve it. I'm not sure actually uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a valid solution. It might also work. I'm not sure what the differences were, but I, I have thought about it. Yeah, so uh, it's probably nice to uh, to compare. Yeah. Or, or could you quickly comment on whether that would have less or more parameters than than the proposed method? Um, less. So you mean you do a normal two D unit, and mm -hmm. then in the output layer you would just com pull over the pull um, or combine the dimension you want to remove. Depends a bit on how you do the pooling in the end. You could do, for example, um, the way I implemented it at first was a five self by one convolution. So basically pull all the output pixels uh, in one layer. Uh, that would have, I think, less parameters mm -hmm. than this model. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any other question? In the front. Yeah. Um, really nice talk, thank you. I, I've got a few questions, well, a question on, um, you mentioned the registration um, for the GA um, yes. work that you've done. Um, and I was just wondering, you mentioned at the end that you've got quite low dice scores and that may be due to some registration misalignments. Yeah. But would you not need good registration for the labeling in the first place? Um, yeah, so the, so the thing is we, uh, we initially acquired our uh, annotations for the GA on the MFAS images and that's what we used for another project and then we used the OCT as additional evidence to grade on the MFAS images. So the MFAS was basically what we were trying to get correct and if the registration with the OCT image wasn't perfect then for that application it wasn't a problem but 
for using it for, uh, for this data, there may be some inaccuracies. Thank you. One last question. So it's not the case. Let's thank the speaker again.